everybody. It's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Hope you all are doing well. Welcome. You are here presumably for a webinar we are hosting to talk about internal communications. But before we get to that, got a couple quick things as folks are coming into the room. Just a little bit of housekeeping for you. Let's start where we always do. If you've been with us before, you know the drill. This is the, what we call the two-word check-in. It's an idea that we borrowed from Professor Brene Brown down at the University of Houston. And what we'd love you to do is don't hit send yet, but make sure you go into the chat, crack that open. Look, make sure you're talking to everyone, or maybe it says all attendees and presenters, and just type in your name, where you're coming in from, and then in two words, how you doing? I'll go ahead and model what that looks like. Everybody else, go ahead and start jumping in there. Let us know. Let's see who's with us today. Again, two words, how you doing, and who's with us? All right, a couple pieces of housekeeping, then we'll get to, get to Jenny. First thing is this. You probably know this, the network publishes a jobs board. So if you have a job to share, please send it our way. If you're looking for uh, a new gig, lots of them out there, including this one, our friend Julia Friedman over at the Hilton Foundation asked us to post this and make the word, get the word out. Given a topic today, we thought it was appropriate. They're looking for a manager of internal communications. You can learn more about that, obviously, right there at comnetwork.org on the jobs board. All right, moving ahead, if we can. Also, just a quick reminder to everybody, uh, we have a listserv that we've been running started in COVID uh, time back in 2020. We've been continuing it. It's available to anybody. There's no charge. And it's a great way to ask a question of a colleague. It's remarkable how quickly we all get responses and, and the variety and the, and the quality of the responses that folks get. So how do you encourage you if you're not part of that listserv, please do take advantage. Don't need to be a member to do that. Let's go ahead. If we could, Mr. T. Also, the newsletter is another thing we do that we make available to everybody in the spirit of trying to help lift up the field and keep folks engaged and connected to one another. Uh, this comes out every month, so our next one will be next week. But suffice to say, if you're not on the list for that newsletter, there's lots of great stuff. We tell you what we're doing, as well as some of the things that are happening around the field that we think are important and worthy of your attention. It's a great way to just kind of stay abreast of things that you ought to be thinking about as you practice in the field. Welcome you to sign up for that, and the information is there. Let's go forward, if we could. Couple quick things here. Circles, chances are you know about this. This is a program that began during the pandemic as well. It is only for network members. So you have to be a member to participate. But the idea is we all need a kitchen cabinet of folks to bounce ideas off of, to occasionally commiserate with. Uh, but suffice to say, circles are oriented in that way. They're built around the idea of perhaps you can find your people in the form of folks who are working on a similar issue or folks who have a similar type of job title, or maybe you share an identity. But there's more information there at Com Network. Uh, circles.org. So check that out. Mr. T, if you would, carry us forward. Other thing that we're doing, and I have a couple updates for our locals that are happening uh, this week, but we have local groups around the country because sometimes these circles are wonderful, but they're virtual. And sometimes you want to just borrow a cup of sugar and you're not going to go from, say, Seattle to Miami to do that. So the way we do this is we bring people together working in the field who share you know, maybe a zip code or an area code. We have 15 of them around the country. And if we could, Mr. T, pivot and just show people a couple quick things. Two of them are meeting this week. This is uh, the first one, our friends out in Portland. Uh, normally have a nice, lovely climate. Not so much if you've been following the national weather. It's a little hot out there today. So they've decided the better part of valor is to wait for a slightly cooler day, which is their norm. So stay tuned. They'll be updating that date. But the event that was planned for Portland this evening uh, has been pushed off to another day and they'll be in touch with you. And that's those lovely folks there are the folks who lead the group in Portland. Moving ahead, we also have our friends in Denver gathering and you can see that that's actually gonna be in August. So a little bit further into the month. Chances are, you know, a lot of those friendly, friendly faces, lovely folks, and they've got some good stuff planned ahead for you. All right, if we could, last one, I believe, Mr. T, actually maybe we have two more. ComNet 22, we're all gonna be gathering in Seattle this fall, October 12th through the 14th. We got some more program updates to give you. Maybe you saw the email we sent the other day. Here's the big thing you need to know. We only have, actually at this point, we have less than 100 seats available for the conference. So if you wanna be with us, we'd love to have you and host you, uh, but we need you to get on that because we are gonna run out of seats soon and then we'll fire up a wait list. And chances are we'll be able to make room for a few folks off that wait list, but, but highly encourage you, if you're, if you're thinking about being with us for Seattle, now's the time to get that seat. We hate to turn folks away and we will have to do it though. So particularly this year because of all the COVID protocols we've got in place. All right, if we could, one more here. We've also got, maybe you saw this announcement, Vule, uh, who runs a blog called Nonprofit AF. I can imagine you know what that means. And Robert Egger, who was sort of the mentor and continues to assist Jose Andreas at World Central Kitchen. Uh, They're gonna be having a conversation with us in Seattle, which we're really excited about. And I think we've got one more maybe T, or that may be it. 
Oh, we're on to Jenny's slide. So I'm going to pass to her before I do so. Just a quick note of thanks to uh, Teresa, who is with us offering ASL services. So if you have need, you can pin her camera up in the corner. I'm going to say goodbye for now, hand it off to Jenny, who is joining us from the UK. So if you hear an accent, it's not your computer. That's what she sounds like, because she's a lovely friend of ours from the UK who's making the time to be with us a little bit later over there. Other little piece of housekeeping, gang. We will take questions at the end of this. And the way we're going to do that is something we've been doing for basically the better part of this year. And that is we're going to invite you what we call office hours. Jenny has been very generous. So what we'll do is we'll put a Zoom link into the chat, which we will make available uh, for everybody to join us. So you can ask questions directly of Jenny. Uh, and she's going to have a couple books to give away. So make sure you make time for that. That'll be uh, between the top of the hour, between 2 and 2.30. So for now, Jenny, if you would, please take it away. And I'll get myself off camera and see you all in a bit. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, just to confirm as well, the chat is now working. So feel free to use that while I'm talking to you. And I hope my accent is not too weird for you uh, as you're listening today. So thank you very much for having me. I'm just going to flip over and share my slides with you so that you can easily see um, what we're going to be talking about today. So here we go. Technology is going to work. Right, here we go. Wonderful. For those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Jenny Field. I've worked in communications for around 20 years. I have my own consultancy now called Redefining Communications, but I have worked inside organisations for around 17, 15 years of my career. I've published a book called Influential Internal Communication. I have a couple of podcasts. I've done some research papers. I'm generally very opinionated about anything to do with communication and the workplace. So I'm very grateful to be here with you today and sharing some of my insights and some of my thoughts around how you can help shape and change internal communication inside your organization. So I want to cover today the internal communication definitions. I want to talk a little bit about the difference between internal communication employee engagement and employee experience because they are different. I'm then going to talk a bit about the foundations of internal communication. We'll talk a bit about people and I'll share with you the six key steps really for impactful communication. It involves stakeholders and audiences and, and things like that. And then I'm going to share with you the framework that I've always used for creating an internal communications strategy. It's the one I used when I set up four different communication functions and it's the one that I come back to again and again and again, because it's quite simple. And it's also really great if you haven't got much resource. I've always been a team of one or two. So I imagine most of you have quite small teams. So I'm well versed in that pain of having so much to do and so little time. So what is internal communication? Now, it's important, as I said, to make that distinction between internal communication, employee engagement and employee experience. Interestingly, in some research that I did back in 2017, we were using internal communication and employee engagement interchangeably, and we are still doing the same today. So it's important for me that we understand the difference because they are different. Uh, and I want to make sure that you're clear on that when it comes to defining the purpose of internal communication inside your organization, because that's quite often what we have to come back to. Internal communication is incredibly broad as a concept. In my career, I've done engagement campaigns to drive engagement inside an organization, but I've also looked at how to save half a million pounds by looking at digital tools to make collaboration better, which is more about efficiency. So because there's so much to do, it's really important to define it. And when it comes to internal communication, there are lots of different definitions which make it hard in itself. So there are definitions from academics, there are definitions from other consultants. What I want to share with you today is my definition for internal communication, and then I've got some other ones for you on employee engagement and employee experience. What's also important is to make the distinction between what internal communication is and what it is when it is a function. And I make that distinction because lots of people inside organizations will manage a budget, but there is a finance function and they are different things. So if we think about communication in that same way, it helps us look at how we might define it in terms of what is it and what is the function there to do. So this is my definition that I use. Internal communication includes everything that gets said and shared inside an organization. 
as a function, its role is to curate, enable and advise on best practice for organisations to communicate effectively, efficiently and in an engaging way. Now, that's important that it's in an engaging way. It's not about employee engagement. But you can see that distinction that I've made there between what it is and then what the function is there to do. So this is something I'd encourage all of you to do when it comes to internal communication in your organisation. Otherwise, you're going to get sucked into doing loads of things that you don't really want to do and you're not really sure why you're doing it. And that is a horrible place to be. So take a bit of time to define that. This is mine. There are others and I'm happy to share others if that's useful as well. This is a definition of employee engagement. Now, this came from McLeod and Clark, who are also based in the UK. They did a report back in 2009, which I know is ages ago now and feels even longer after the last few years. But they talk about a workplace approach. Now, that's important because we tend to lean on measuring employee engagement, but it's an approach. And I'm not sure how you measure an approach, but that's often where we end up as communicators. So this is their definition. It's linked to well-being. It's linked to being committed to goals and values. It's a very individual thing, employee engagement. And there are lots of factors that contribute to that. Then we've got employee experience, couple of definitions here. We've got one about creating an operating environment that inspires people. And then we've got another one from Jacob Morgan about designing one where people want to show up by focusing on cultural, technological and physical environments. Now, employee experience has been tested hugely in the last few years because of the pandemic. Part of that is because of the lack of physical environments that people have been going to for work. So when I I think about employee experience today, I'm thinking about belonging, I'm thinking about psychological safety. I'm also thinking about alignment when it comes to engagement and how aligned people are to the organization strategies. So I think there's more complexity here in terms of how these are interconnected, but it's not something I'm going to go into today because it's something I'm working on behind the scenes and researching at, at the moment. But what's important for me is that you take that time to really define internal communication for your organization and the purpose of it for what you're trying to do. Now, whenever I speak about communications or business or leadership or any of those things, I will always talk about the need to understand people. And that's because organizations are people. Organizations don't exist without people. And it's easy to forget that and get stuck on processes and systems and things like that. But we fundamentally need people in order for organizations to thrive. And the reason I want to talk about that first is because our brains haven't really evolved since we were cave people. They're very much the same when the world was a very different place. And what that means is that our instincts, our reactions, the way we think about things, the way we respond to change are all based on a world that is a million years away, well, probably thousands of years away from where we are today. And that's important. So if I take you back to us being cave people and we are hunting on the Serengeti to try and find some food, okay? Now, as a human being, I am looking for food. I need to find food in order to survive. So I'm looking for a berry, I'm looking for something to, to maybe you know, kill so I can eat it. But I've also got to keep an eye out for a saber toothed tiger because that's going to kill me. So I've got to be aware of danger and risk and something that's coming at me because that's going to be the end of me. I'm going to be dead. There's no more looking for berries. Very different. So when I'm looking for this reward and this food and this something that I need to survive, I'm going to be looking for any kind of threat. And anything that I see that's a rustle in a bush or anything that I hear, I'm going to immediately think is danger and a threat. When that rustle in a bush comes out and it's a rabbit, I can relax. But my immediate reaction is that's danger. That's going to hurt me. This is going to be the end of me. And that brain is still working in the environment we're in today. So I'm trying to make sure that I can see what's going to happen. My brain is designed to predict what's going to happen. It's designed to make sure that I'm safe. So to make sure that I'm safe, it's got to predict that rustle in a bush. Oh my God, that's not a rabbit. It's a saber tooth tiger, I'm dead. All of that comes back to the fact that I need to predict what's going to happen. Is there food? Is there danger? All those things. 
take that into organizations today and our need to feel safe to predict what's going to happen and the amount of change and ambiguity that's going on is why we react quite not violently but it's why we react quite aggressively in some ways to change because we can't predict what's going to happen I can't predict what that Russell in a bush is. So I'm gonna get anxious and worried and scared. I can't predict if my job's safe because I've been told they're gonna to be making cuts, but they haven't told me what, they haven't told me when, they haven't told me anything. And that worry and that fear is in us. It's instinctive in us as human beings. So when it comes to doing any kind of organizational change or any kind of communication, we have to come back to that need for us to stay safe, that need to be able to predict. Because if we can't do that, we're going to make up a story that's really bad. And Sean mentioned Dr. Brene Brown at the start of this webinar today. And Brene talks about the story that you tell yourself. It's so easy for us to tell ourselves a story when something bad might be happening. And we do that to keep ourselves feel safe. If you're on a, on a Zoom call or a Teams call and people have got their cameras off, you might be thinking, oh, they've got their cameras off because they don't want to really engage with me. They're not interested in what I've got to say. You will make up a story that is going to be bad because you want to keep yourself safe and that protects you from that sort of risk. What's interesting about this for communicators is it doesn't really matter whether the news is good or bad when you don't know what's going to happen. So if you imagine a time where you may have been or you may not have been waiting for test results, you might be waiting for some results from the doctor and that weight and that unknown makes you feel anxious, stressed, worried, all those things. When you get those test results, you can then make a plan. If those test results are good, that's great. Relief, brilliant, I can carry on about my life. If those test results are not so good, okay, we can make a plan, we know what we're gonna do. We feel better just knowing and being able to do that prediction. And that's really important when it comes to communication. Silence is not helpful for people inside organizations. So when we talk about ambiguity and change and all of these things, we have to remember that we need information in order to feel safe. We're naturally very curious, we like novelty. There's lots of things about the brain that are really helpful to understand. And this is why I did a whole chapter on understanding people in the book. And there are other books I'm happy to recommend if you really wanna dive into this as well. So when it comes to communication, remember people want to feel safe. They want to be able to predict give them as much information as you can. It's in us as human beings. It's not something that's just in certain people. It's in all of us to varying degrees. Now, the foundations of communication, there are six of those. So I often talk about the six keys to impactful communication. I talk about these with lots of different teams, whether you're communicators, whether you are working in operations, finance, it doesn't matter. These are six keys around communication that are really the foundations that help us build great communication inside organizations. Now, the first one is around focusing on the audience. And I will always say, you are not writing for yourself, you are writing for other people. And there will be things we will do in our career that we think are rubbish, but other people really like. And I always come back to a newsletter that I did for a cookie brand, and it was called Crumbs. And it was rubbish, <laughs> in my opinion. But other people loved it because it was completely right for the audience. We'd done enough analysis to really understand what they wanted. So we have to understand when we're talking to leaders or advising people to do the communication, this isn't about what you want, it's about what your audience wants. And we need to understand that audience, we need to understand them in terms of what they know about topics, we need to know what they pay to read, which is a strange one, but people will pay to read lots of different types of content. Some people will want video content, some people will want really long in-depth papers. Understanding that and those different preferences is really helpful for us to tailor our communication. And importantly, when we're thinking about the audience, we have to get to know our stakeholders. And I've got a couple of maps and ways of doing that that I want to share with you today in case this is something you're starting to look at in your organization. Now the first one is how you categorize your stakeholders. So ignore the box at the moment. 
What's important to do, first of all, is understand the different sort of segments, different uh, stakeholders you've got inside your organization as a whole. And you can do that by locations, by gender, by attitudes, opinions. You can do that in lots of different ways. The box comes in handy if you're looking at your stakeholders for a specific specific project. So you might have various different people that you've got in those different lists, and we need to map them on this grid for a project that you're doing. So some of you might be doing change programs, you might be doing um, campaigns, you might be doing a new strategy, you might be looking at hybrid work and how you bring people back to an office, you might be looking at lots of different things. For any of those, you can start to map your stakeholders on here. And on here, we've got boxes around influence and interest. So in box B, you've got someone with a really high interest in what you're doing, but they have no influence whatsoever in the outcome of that. <laughs> so they really want to know stuff, but it doesn't have any impact at all in what you're doing. And these are the stakeholders that suck our time away. So being able to map them and think about how to manage them can be really helpful when you've got a project going on and you're very low on resource. Now, there's another model I want to share with you, and I learned this model in February this year when I was doing a course on how to be a uh, certified company director. And it's the seven Ds of stakeholders. And this looks at power and urgency and legitimacy. And I just I quite like this. It's quite provocative because of the language it uses, which I also quite like. Uh, it talks about dangerous stakeholders. So what you've got here in this sort of Venn diagram is people with power, people with urgency and people with legitimacy. And really what you want is the person in the middle, that definitive stakeholder, because they've got all of those things and therefore they're the most important. But if you've got someone that's got no power and lots of urgency, they're just demanding, quite frankly, and exhausting. So we have to make sure that we are spending our time with the right stakeholders and giving our time to the right places. That's not to say you ignore the demanding ones, but you find a way to manage them in a different way once we've got them in the right sort of buckets. So there's a couple of options there if you're looking at stakeholders. They're two of my favourites that I often come back to. Now, the second key is around setting a clear goal. You always have to be clear about why you are writing the presentation, having the meeting, uh, any of those things. And I bring meetings into this because they are such a huge part of communication inside organisations. So always ask, what is the outcome you're looking for? What are you trying to achieve? And I talk about this a lot when I talk about boundary setting with other people. Like, why am I being invited to the meeting? <laughs> What are you trying to achieve by me being there and making sure that my time is being used in the right way? I always refer to the model think, feel, do. So if anyone's coming to you to ask you to communicate anything, always ask the questions. What do you want people to think? Well, how do you want people to feel? And what do you want them to do? Now, you might not have all of those. I was just talking to a client uh, this afternoon about a new in Induction they're looking at and that's really about how people feel and what they think it's not really anything about what they do it's about that initial onboarding experience and that induction and that wow feeling and that oh I've joined an amazing company and, and those sorts of feelings and thoughts so it doesn't have to be all of them but always make sure you're very clear about why you're doing something and ask lots of questions we are naturally curious totally okay it's important to get the tone right. Now, this is always a tricky balance for communicators when you're writing for an organization or a leader and not you and, and all of those things. So it's making sure that the tone is personal enough and human enough, but also reflects the brand or external brand of the organization. And also important to remember that tone is lost in text. So we really have to think about how we're using tone, how that might come across, how we can bring tone forward in different ways in different channels. We have to keep it simple. So I love this study by uh, Daniel Oppenheimer. And he found that people actually think you're less intelligent and you are less credible if you use long words when shorter words will do. And I see this a lot with people replacing short words with long words, thinking it's, it's going to you know, make sense. And if any of you have watched Friends, the sitcom, you might remember the scene where Joey writes a letter for Chandler and Monica for their adoption. And in that, he uses the thesaurus and changes the word heart to large aortic valve and changes his name, Joey, 
to baby kangaroo. Uh, and it just is a really nice example of why it makes you sound less intelligent <laughs> when you use long words when you don't need them. Also important to drop the jargon. So make sure that you're explaining acronyms, making sure that people know the language. We talked earlier on about belonging as part of employee experience. If you're a very jargon heavy organization, it's very easy for people to feel like they don't belong somewhere if there's lots of uh, jargon, lots of acronyms. So important to make sure that those are explained regardless of, of how long you might have been writing it. The next is around structure. So whenever you're doing a presentation or a piece of content, we always come back to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them and then tell them what you told them. Uh, and that's just make sure that people have got a sense of what's happening. So up front today, I told you what I was going to tell you. I'm now telling you. Uh, and then at the end, I'll do a little summary and just summarize what we've talked about. And we'll pick that up again uh, in the office hours after this as well. Making sure that opening paragraphs are clear, that things aren't buried in long messages. And being logical is really important, especially if you're doing a presentation or you've got a, um, an internet or a magazine or whatever you might have as your communication tools. There has to be logic and flow to that so people know what's coming. It sort of comes back to that need to predict. Um, being able to know what's coming helps us feel safe and like, okay, this is going to be fine. I know what's happening. We do that in supermarkets. So most supermarkets follow a very similar flow of fruit and vegetables at the front, eggs somewhere in the middle, alcohol at the end. It's a fairly universal global approach to supermarket design, it seems. Um, and TV series are the same. You have uh, the recap and then you have the episode and then sometimes you have what's coming up next. It's all about that structure to help people feel comfortable in terms of what's coming up or what's happened. And the final one is about adapting to the medium. So adapting to the channel that you're using making sure that the content and the channel are matched. It's very easy for us to stick with the same kind of formats, very easy for us to stick with a PowerPoint or an Excel spreadsheet or an email, when maybe a voice note or a podcast would be better or an infographic or virtual reality or a simulation. There's so much now that we can do to create a richer experience depending on what it is we want people to think, feel and do on the back of that. Now, I've popped some research in here around our attention span, which is uh, in question in a lot of places. So there's a lot of talk about our attention spans getting worse, saying it's now down to about 8.25 seconds. But there's also research that says it's about context. Someone said to me the other day, I struggle to understand why people are talking about how our attention span has decreased when I can spend seven hours binge watching a series on Netflix. And I think it's a very valid point. <laughs> so we have to think about whether or not there is a context to that that's worth exploring. Now I want to move on to talking about how to create an internal communication strategy, because there are some elements here, like I said at the beginning, that are things that I've used again and again in my time in doing this. And it's the framework I come back to every time, because quite often I'm working with organizations that don't have an internal communication function, are just starting from scratch, or are looking at ways to do things quite simply and quite quickly, but with some sense of framework around it. So that's what I want to share with you today. And there we go. Um, so there are five steps that I want to talk you through, and they are um, linear. So they do work one step at a time. You can bring the first two together, but we have to start with the first one. You can't start kind of halfway through. That just you know, will never work. Um, so what we've got is these five different steps. So we've got insight. We've got business intelligence. Then we've got principles. And then we've got communication. And then we've got measurement. And these are the different five areas that I would be looking at if I was coming into your organization to help you look at how to change internal communication or how to create the strategy but they're also ones that you can just do by yourselves you don't need you don't need someone to come in and help you do it which every consultant hates me for um, but there's all things in here that is within your gift to be able to do insight is the first one so this is the research piece really so depending on what you've got or any conversations you've had you might have things already. So you might have done 
um, an employee engagement survey. OK, now that will help you when it comes to communication, probably because your organisation wants to look at that as a measure, albeit a different conversation. <laughs> but you will get a bit of a read on how people are feeling and you can delve into that and see whether there's an issue around alignment to the strategy, whether people understand the purpose of the organisation, whether there's trust in the organisation. These are all big things that we need to look at as, as communicators, because communication is the tangible representation of culture. So if there's low trust or people don't know why they're doing what they're doing, we have to explore that and look at how communication can help uh, change that and help nudge that. So you might not have done any research at all, in which case we need to start with an internal communications audit. Now, if you haven't done an audit before, this is about making sure that you know what people want to know. You also need to explore what people need to know. So there's a difference for me around what I need to know to do my job versus what I want to know about the organization that I work for. And they are different types of content. And that's important to be, um, it's important to be distinguished because they have different channels and different needs and different outcomes. So we need to understand what people need to know and what people want to know. And then we also need to ask them sort of how they want to know that. And that's always a difficult question because you don't know what you don't know. So over the years, when I've asked people, you know, would you like an intranet? Most people say, well, I don't know because I don't really know what that is <laughs> if I work in a coffee shop selling coffee and baguettes. Um, but I also can't visualise that. I don't know how that's going to help me. So we often ask people, what's the problem that communication can solve? And that opens up quite a nice dialogue because you start to explore the problems inside the organization that are linked to communication and how you can start to solve that. So whenever we're doing insight work, if you've got uh, different employee numbers would depend on, on how much you might want to do here. So if you've got over 500 people in your organization, you might want to look at a combination of a survey. Uh, you might want to look at some focus groups, you might want to look at some one-to-one -one conversations, and that will help you get a bit of an understanding about what's going on. If you've got less people, you can kind of break that down. So you might just do some one-to-one -one interviews and some focus groups, or you might just do a survey and focus groups. You should never do just a survey because you don't get rich enough data from that. And if you start with the audit or the survey, then you can delve into that in focus groups or one-to-one -one conversations. Um, but if you just do a survey, you're not gonna get enough from that to do the depth of stuff you need to do. You can do it, but to really get underneath issues and make sure that you're doing stuff for the long-term, having conversations is just so important. Um, so that's the insight piece. Also very important to look at the perception of the organization externally as well as internally. If we just focus on the internal piece, it makes it very difficult for us to link into things like reputation, to link into employee value proposition, which might be something you're looking at. There's lots of things that need to be sort of joined up between internal and external. So understanding what's going on uh, outside the organization is really important as well. You can also start to look at uh, the hierarchy in the organization. So we would often, and I would often talk to the leadership team, and then I would talk to the majority of the employee base, because that will always highlight a gap between what the leaders think's going on and what's really going on. So that's getting into kind of more broader um, overall employee experience research. But when you're looking at communication, it's really important to me to look at that in terms of behaviors and people and things like that as well. But this will also come back to what the function's purpose is for you in your organization. And that often comes from doing the insight in these first couple of sort of phases so you know what you're there to do. I always talk about a story from when I worked for a CEO who was slightly terrifying and one of the words they used all the time was value. It was a word they used very specifically. I don't know that it's a word every CEO uses but for this one it was always the question what value does that bring? What value does that add to any function? And I remember sitting sitting out uh, at my desk and thinking, I don't know what they mean by value when it comes to communication, because we'd already established that communication wasn't particularly high on their agenda. Uh, and I tried data and things like that. 
and none of that was working. And so I ended up going into their office and saying, I don't know what you mean by value, which I can assure you was a very scary conversation. <laughs> um, and I sort of went in sort of quietly and said, can you tell me what you mean by value when it's applied to communication? And they said to me, it's about risk. And I thought, OK, I definitely hadn't gone there was my thinking of, of what I was here to do. And they said it's about reputational risk and, and overall risk in the organisation. And this role, just for clarity, I was the global head of communications at the time, so internal and external. But that conversation, that probably less than 10 minute conversation helped me reshape my whole strategy, my whole approach to my function and what it was there to do. So rather than talking about, oh, I need to go to visit the team in the States to help them look at their collaboration platform because we really need to engage people in this change and it's really exciting. That was never going to make them sign off a budget for me to go and do that. But when I say, I need to go over to the States because there's a risk they're going to spend half a million pounds on a, on a piece of software that we don't need, <sighs> booked straight on a plane. So we have to have these conversations. We have to listen to people. We have to have that opportunity to get that insight to help us really shape what we're doing and what our function is there to do. And it was a very valuable lesson to me of having the courage to ask difficult conversations and then taking action on those and if I'd done it probably a year earlier, my life would have been a lot easier. So it's always nice to reflect on that as well. Um, so that's insight. So there's quite a lot in there that's important to think about. And like I said, this, these are things you can do yourselves. You can use loads of different um, platforms and tools to, to do surveys and things like that. It doesn't have to be um, hugely complicated and costly. The next one is business intelligence. Now, this is uh, really important. It might be more organizational intelligence for, for you folks here, but this is about what does the organization do? So I often talk about if you provide a service, if you're making things, whatever that might be, how does that happen? Like what's the, what's the process for those things to happen? And who needs to talk to each other to make sure that happens? because you're never going to get that from looking at a set of organizational charts. They're not going to tell you how communication needs to flow through an organization in order for that organization to achieve what it wants to achieve. So we need to understand that as communicators to know how things actually get done. We need to understand the IT infrastructure. We need to look at annual reports. We need to look at business structure. We need to look at all of those fundamental things that make up an organization to make sure that we are doing everything that we need to do linked to the organization. And this for me comes back to what is your purpose of internal communication? Because ultimately internal communication is there to make sure people are doing what you want them to do to achieve the organization's goals. And that feels very cold and very heartless, but ultimately that's really what we're there to do. And if we don't understand what the organization is trying to do, we can't possibly communicate effectively with people to get them behind that. And that's really important. So we have to understand that. I can see in the, the chat that someone said that business intelligence is vastly underemphasized or gets lost in a lot of internal communications processes. And it's so true. And, it, and, and alongside that, business acumen is something we often talk about. So understanding the language of the business, how people talk, what's the structure of the business? You know, is it a charity? Is it a partnership? You know, what is all the governance things that go on there so that you know how to advise in the way that's appropriate for the organization? If we just get sucked into employee engagement as internal communicators, we can go down a bit of a rabbit hole that I'm not sure is particularly helpful. So really important to think about business intelligence and how, how that can help. The next one is principles. So this is this is the sort of framework for setting up internal communication so your principles are your functional objective so now you've got your insight you've got the research you know what needs to happen what are we going to do with that <laughs> it's always the question and this is really important if you're a small team this is where it can be helpful to bring in some external advice it's what i've done in the past i remember getting all of my data through when i'd done my um, audit and my insight and my conversations and in that organization I had uh, I had a workforce of 10,000 people I was uh, internal communications manager and those 10,000 people were predominantly 
deskless workers. They were in hospitality. So 8,000 of them were, were that. So we did this piece of research and I looked at all of the insight and got to the conclusion that I needed to create a printed newspaper that was tailored to each brand. We had 500 brands tailored to each brand every week. And that is not a solution that is viable when you have no budget and you're a very new function because a printed newsletter for that number of people would have been ridiculous. But I got a bit stuck in that's what was needed. And so I ended up bringing in someone just for the day to just help me kind of work through that. What we ended up building was a bespoke intranet where people could subscribe to topics and it generated an automatic digital newsletter that could then be printed by the store manager and stuck on a notice board for all of the staff to be able to read. So you sometimes that's where it's helpful because you can get a bit stuck in your own head. Um, I love that someone's popped in the chat every week. They actually went to daily, not the printed, but the online ones actually went to daily because of the amount of content that was going out. But it was very tailored. It was subscribed content based on your brand and location and relevance is what's really important. I'm happy to delve into that a little bit more when we get into the, the chat section, but it's the relevance piece that's important there. So when you're looking at the principles, you're looking at your objectives, you're looking at the principles for the organization. How do I structure a team or structure a function that's going to align to the principles of the organization? What's the business strategy? And then how do I create a communication strategy that's going to support that. And that's what's important. So this is sort of just your check in midway point. We've got the research and the insight. Right now, what are we going to do? Then we can start to talk about the communication. And this is where we start to look at channels and content and audiences and information. So I'm going to share with you an example of a channel matrix and also a content strategy, because these are two documents that I have used over the years. Audience mapping, we've sort of covered in the stakeholder section when we were looking at the foundations and the, the keys of impactful communication. An information matrix is, is sort of done within business intelligence, but we can have a little look at what the information matrix might start to look like as well. But the channel matrix and the content strategy are the two templates that we always use with clients, templates I used before, to get people to think about how they're communicating. Uh, so I can share templates for these as well, but you can also create one just in a word or, or a spreadsheet. Stay with me. I know it looks very busy on the screen. So on the left hand side, you've got the different sections. You've got channel. So it's the name of the channel that goes along the top. Then underneath that, you've got the tool. So kind of the how. Then underneath that, you've got your frequency. Underneath that, you've got audience. And then underneath that, you've got your content. Now, I used to use this in inductions for people and whenever I was talking to people about what we did as a function. So if I go through this a little bit, you can see how it, it was created. This was my actual channel matrix when I was working in an organization. It had a few other bits on it, but only probably about another three. So what you can see is we've got connections, which is like SharePoint, and that is online, it's constant, it's for all global employees with an email address. And the type of news we share is things like corporate news, departmental updates. Uh, we allow people to share content, those sorts of things. And then we've got a UK conference. That's face-to-face. -face. It's annually in October. It's only for operations staff. And its content is focused on reward and recognition and key business updates. You sort of get the gist about how mapping out your channels like this helps you see your frequency and helps you see your audience. When I review these with clients, the biggest thing I'm noticing at the moment is a lack of segmentation in the audience. So everything's just going to everybody. Um, and the tool is really just all online, which is partly linked to the pandemic, but it's important to think about that richness of communication and what's actually going to be appropriate. Uh, and the frequency isn't necessarily staggered enough across the kind of calendar year. So if you're doing something every other month and something every month and something quarterly, are they staggered enough? Um, and so this is really helpful. So if you haven't done one of these and feel free to stay in the chat, whether you've done this all the time or whether this is something that's new to you, this is a really um, kind of helpful framework that we always come back to. And it just helps you get that sort of at a glance look. 
The content stuff there also helps you have control over your function. I cannot tell you the number of times people would come to me and ask me to put something in our magazine. What was it? Magazine. It was in the magazine um, around someone having a baby. Now that's lovely news, but it wasn't necessarily appropriate for that particular channel. So having a channel matrix meant we were able to have some of those conversations. If we hadn't done this, we could have been guided by different stakeholders and whoever shouts loudest in terms of how that channel takes shape and how that content takes shape. And we have to remember that we are the experts here, not the head of operations or the finance manager. You know, we are communication experts, so we know which channel and which content are going to be best linked uh, together. Um, oh, someone's just asked if I can define flavour. So flavour was a print magazine. We called it flavour because we were in hospitality. So there was a lot of food elements to it. So that was the name. Um, and it was lots of features about people. It was very story led. Uh, it was every other month. It started quarterly. And then I think we changed it. And then we ditched it in the end. We got rid of it because it wasn't getting through to the frontline workers. It was just sitting in piles um, in sort of canteens and things, which is just very, very sad when you walk into somewhere and just see piles of your magazine. Um, so that's really important to, so that, that's that sort of explanation. So have a little look at that and see um, whether that kind of helps you. I can see some people in the chat saying it's helpful. The next one I wanna show you is the content strategy, which is sort of flipping this around a little bit but it's linking your content to your organizational strategy. I don't have this one as complete because I've used it with a couple of clients, but essentially along the top, you've got your business or organizational objective, and that might be something like um, growing sales or changing um, how people feel about our service. You will have different business objectives. Then you can create sort of content pillars underneath that. So in objective two, we've got some content pillars there that are videos and stories from the floor, and we've got apprentice features and news about new products. Now that objective could be more about, um, we want to make sure that we grow our frontline workers engagement in the organization, or we want to encourage people to um, have more of a career with us than they might not have already. So how do we do that? So linking your content to the business objective. Then underneath that, you've got your target audience and you've got a primary and a secondary audience. And then you've got your channels underneath that. This is a bit more detailed. And if I'm honest, this is where people kind of get a bit stuck. So if, because this is hard and it's why internal communication is a profession. So if this feels too much, just do the channel matrix and you'll be off and running. Once you've got that, depending on the maturity of your function, this is a nice place to evolve to. But don't feel like you've got to do both of those things. They might all be um, kind of too much to do both of those. But this is a nice way to think about what's the objective and what's the content that we're sharing that links to that. And then the final um, step before I hand back over to Sean is measurement. Now, measurement is something that I think scares us all a little bit, to be honest, because it's a very big word and it can all make us get a little bit overwhelmed and then we just don't do it. I have very rarely measured anything, which I don't say lightly, but I say it because I want to give some comfort to people that might not be doing any measurement. And I can hear other people I know in my head screaming at me for saying it out loud. But my measurement was linked to the organizational success. So if someone came to me and said, Jenny, we need to do uh, a load of communication out because we need to reduce accidents. Our accidents are at 80% and we need to reduce them to 60%. Still very high. Um, and we need to get some communication out there. Great. Have you got a budget? Yes. Great. I will brief a creative team. We'll do this. We'll do this. There's other things happening in the organization to reduce accidents. We're going to have training from the learning and development team. They're going to remodel warehouse shop floors to change the flow of people to reduce accidents. And so my measurement is the reduction of accidents. I can measure how many people might have seen my creative posters or the creative campaign. And I can say 25 people clicked on this news story. 
but I need to be impacting the accidents. Otherwise, what I'm doing isn't particularly helpful. And so that's what I'd encourage you to look at when you're looking at measurement. Now I've put on here that this is linked to the maturity of the function, and that's really important. When I give that example, I was kind of three, four, five years into a function. If I was just starting today, my measurement is going to be the launch of some channels. It's going to be um, sentiment on some of the content that we're sharing, and it's going to be on some of those foundations and getting things in place. It has to be linked to the maturity of your function. It's not gonna be the same for everybody. And what you need to measure will be different from what someone else needs to measure. So making sure that you've got that link uh, to kind of what you're doing and link it back to your principles. You know, you might have things in there that are based on, you know, we need to set up the function and do this and do that. So your KPIs, your key performance indicators should be linked a little bit to that. So those are the ways I would start to look at measurement. I think if you're looking at um, kind of measuring content or measuring digital channels, there's loads of stuff you can do around that to help you change your content strategy and help you look at how you're measuring success and impact and, and different things. But just be realistic about what you can measure and measure the things that are helping the organization change and do what the organization needs to do. It doesn't have to be about how many people saw a story or how many people saw a poster. That doesn't help us always achieve what we want to achieve. I could look at a poster and not do anything. So <laughs> that's why it's not particularly useful. So that's the end of the five steps. I'm now gonna hand back over to Sean, who I'm hoping is still with us and can switch his camera back on and come back on and say hello. There he is. Hello. I am. Thank you. This was amazing. We have a couple of minutes before the top of the hour. So one question we'll take here, and then we're going to go ahead and invite people a little early over into office hours. But a question mm -hmm. coming up from our friend Gabriella, and she says, and was, let me put on the specs because things get tiny here. How do you measure collaboration, creativity, thinking time in producing deliverables? Thinking about editorial and design work that is part of communications. So how do you so about question, your own internal process, I suppose, is a way of Yeah. Thinking. So I suppose I'd, I'd, I'm going to come back to you with another question, which is less helpful, isn't it? But why do you want to measure that? So for me, if, if, if someone's to measure my collaboration, creativity or those processes, the measurement is the outputs or the outcomes of the things that you're creating. Um, and if those things are fit for purpose and they're working, then you're getting success over that time. I think if you're being pulled in lots of different directions and therefore you're not having that time, I'm reading between the lines here, but I'm wondering if there's a, I need to have time for this, but I don't have it. How can I sort of justify that time when it's so needed? It's really easy to do stuff that adds very little value. And I think that it's important to stop and come back to find the purpose of your organization and then work out what you need to do in order to achieve that. Um, so it's about taking some of those sort of backward steps to then come forward a little bit but we use big words like creativity and collaboration and we've got to think about the tangible outputs and I, I say this a lot when I judge awards which I sometimes do in communication some of the campaigns are amazingly creative but the objectives they've set to deliver them aren't measurable so I'm not really sure what we were trying to achieve I mean it looks lovely but <laughs> has it done what we said it needed to do yeah, and, outcomes and that's, not outputs you know, right Yes, exactly. So that's kind of the thing to come back to, but very happy to chat more about it in the next session if that's helpful as well.